Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Structural Geology and Plate Tectonics. Now in our second lecture, we are going to talk about the nature of uh, lithospheric plates and uh, plate boundaries. Uh, we are seeing here a map that uh, is the result of bathymetric mapping of this ocean floor. And that means uh, bathymetric means the depth distribution of the ocean floor, which we uh, vaguely can see here, the ocean floor has uh, large areas that are fairly flat. We see here, for instance, such areas, large areas without major topography. We see that also here in the Pacific Ocean, uh, large areas. These we are calling the abyssal plains. And uh, we can see other areas that uh, show quite significant topography. This is uh, highlighted here in this kind of texture. We also see here features in the Indian Ocean here over there and uh, in uh, the uh, East Asian puzzle of small little plates. And of course, we can see highlighted here the mid-oceanic ridges, the areas at which new oceanic lithosphere is generated. As uh, plateaus, as uh, elevated areas, we obviously see the large land masses, the continents of the Earth uh, with uh, Africa, Asia, Americas, you know all them. Um, Antarctica is hardly shown here because uh, this map is cut off in the north and in the south. Uh, but we can see that here the topography on the continents is uh, similarly variable with large areas that are fairly flat. In Australia also are fairly large and flat areas in South America. North America has these zones. But there are also topographically high areas like here in the Himalayas and here in the Himalayan Alpine mountain chain that uh, runs through southern Europe and um, Central Asia, uh, all the way to East Asia here in these uh, regions. Here we see a, in a cross section the typical topography of a oceanic basin. For instance, here between uh, somewhere between North America and Africa, showing the topography of the um, seafloor of the Atlantic Ocean with obviously topographically high continental margins that we see here that drop uh, fairly steeply into large abyssal plains where we see a deep sea floor and uh, relatively uniform topography. We reach then here the mid-oceanic ridge that is uh, seen here in uh, a bilateral elevated area. The mid-oceanic ridge here is usually a couple of thousand meters elevated above the abyssal plains that we see here. Unfortunately, here is no vertical scale. But uh, abyssal plains are typically 4,000 meters, 4 to 5,000 meters water depth. And the mid-oceanic ridges may have only 2,000 or 1,000 meter in water depth. Then here on the other side of the ridge, we again go into an abyssal plain until we reach the opposite continental margin, where the a sea floor is rising and uh, grades into a continental crust, as we will see, and uh, finally reach a, reach a sea level at the beach, uh, in this case here, somewhere in West Africa. Also here on this uh, colorful map, we can see the distribution of uh, depth, uh, blue colors would be uh, deep water, abyssal plains. The light blue colors that we see here in the mid-oceanic ridge area and along the continental shelves highlight shallow water conditions. And uh, in green, we see uh, everything that is above the sea level uh, on land in Africa and North America. Here we come back to the Hess-Dietz concept of seafloor spreading that was developed in the uh, very early 1960s. And uh, we can see that the process of seafloor spreading already was uh, assumed and presumed. And uh, also, subduction of uh, oceanic lithosphere uh, was a part of this concept. But uh, in the early 1960s, uh, still very little was known. That was about to change when bathymetric mapping of the ocean floor took place and uh, made progress and uh, provided more and more detail and more and more detailed knowledge about the topography and structure of oceanic basins. In addition to the topographic patterns that we uh, just have looked at and that are characteristic for the structure of uh, 
most oceanic base, basins that we see today, we found uh, not only good correlation with the Hess Deeds model, model that uh, came from the topographic information, we also found evidence for seafloor spreading in form of magnetic anomaly patterns that were uh, analyzed uh, in the 60s, particularly in large scale. Evidence now is here something different compared to a correlation or an agreement of observations. The topography, of course, uh, does give us a bilateral distribution of topographic changes from abyssal plains to a mid-oceanic ridge and then on the other side of that ridge back into the abyssal plain and a bilateral also increase in uh, topographic height towards the uh, continental crust. Uh, however, this is no, not yet uh, evidence for the fact that seafloor actually is bilaterally spreading along the uh, mid-oceanic ridges. This evidence was provided by the magnetic anomaly patterns. And such magnetic anomaly patterns uh, can be researched uh, using a research vessel that drags a magnetometer. And this magnetometer is detecting the polarization of the magnetic properties of the magnetic minerals in the oceanic crust. So the seafloor contains a certain type of rocks, uh, basaltic rocks essentially. In these basaltic rocks, there are magnetic minerals, and these magnetic minerals have stored the paleomagnetic anomaly, the paleomagnetic information uh, in, that can be measured using such magnetometers. Here we see such an example that uh, when a research vessel is moving over the seafloor and drags its magnetometer, that this magnetometer picks up what we call magnetic anomalies. And these anomalies can change laterally, as we see here. A negative anom anomaly would be measured here over a certain period, which corresponds to uh, such a piece of the seafloor. And then it abruptly changes into a positive magnetic anomaly. So where do these magnetic anomalies come from? These magnetic anomalies correlate with the reversal of the magnetic field of the Earth. We have seen that the magnetic anomalies that are created by the Earth's magnetic field can be used for paleolatitude investigation of uh, the deposition of rocks and therefore have helped us to determine the apparent polar wander path, which gives us clue about continental movement. Here we have an additional feature of the Earth's magnetic field. The Earth's magnetic field can change polarity between magnetic north and south pole uh, in certain geological time intervals, typically a few hundred thousand years. At such time intervals, the polarity of north and south pole can reverse. What we see today is what we are calling the magnetic normal or a positive anomaly. A negative anom anomaly would occur when magnetic north and south pole change position. So what is today the magnetic south pole could be in the future the magnetic north pole. These kinds of patterns, if they happen over time, if they change over time, uh, will apply globally. And that means if along a mid-oceanic ridge some oceanic crust is formed, it will have uniformly either a positive or a negative magnetic anomaly. If then the polarity of the Earth's magnetic field changes and north and south magnetic pole in the Earth uh, change positions, then we will come from a positive anomaly to a negative anomaly. And what we are seeing here mapped is a part of the data records that show how the polarity in the ocean floor has changed. At the current mid-oceanic ridge, in dark blue color, we see a strip of oceanic crust that shows a positive anomaly, the magnetic normal. We see bilaterally here strips where the polarity was reversed. And what looks here uh, slightly uh, as a slightly chaotic pattern, in fact, is something fairly regular. Here we see the position of the magnetic north pole is as it is today, as we know it. Here we see in the past there was a period where seafloor was generated, 
that has a reversed magnetic pattern. In principle, and here you can see in uh, the Atlantic view will determine very similar patterns. In principle, that would look as it is shown here in this uh, graphical illustration. Along the mid-oceanic ridge, at the current mid-oceanic ridge, we would find in the northern hemisphere a magnetic currents that are pointing downwards. Because it's the northern hemisphere, in the southern hemisphere, this would be just the other way around. This is what we call the normal polarity. That is what we observe in, the to in today's Earth magnetic field. When you move away laterally from the mid-oceanic ridge, you will enter on either side a strip of reverse polarity. The oceanic crust that were formed at this time here uh, had a reverse polarity compared to what we see today. And such a strip would bilaterally occur on either side of the mid-oceanic ridge. A bit further into the geological past, there would again then be a time period at which uh, normal polarity uh, prevailed and oceanic crust of that polarity would have generated, and so on and so forth. This regular pattern with a bilateral reversal and uh, from normal to reversed polarity and back to normal, that is good evidence to show that we have a bilateral generation of seafloor along the mid-oceanic ridges. Of course, striking evidence then came when uh, absolute age dating was done in such segments of uh, either reversed or normal polarity. And you would find in such a segment and such a segment equally old crust on either side of the mid-oceanic ridge. And away from the mid-oceanic ridge laterally, the seafloor would become older and older. With these two observations and data sets in combination, we uh, have now good evidence that along mid-oceanic ridges, seafloor is generated. Young seafloor exists here in this region, and laterally it is becoming older and older. And together with this increasing age, we see a documentation of the reversal of the Earth magnetic field in Earth history. Here's again another illustration that shows from uh, time 1 to 2, 3, and 4 how seafloor is generated and how magnetic reversals laterally generate this stripe pattern that we see in the oceanic uh, anomaly patterns. Of course, this is not a color difference in the oceanic crust, but here in different grayscales, we see the uh, relative change of a magnetic normal to a reversed magnetic polarity. So here at time one, we generate uh, in some time in the geological past a uh, uh, polarity that is pointing upward, if that is in the northern hemisphere, an upward pointing uh, magnetic pattern would indicate that we have a reversed polarity at time one. At time two, we see that here the um, oceanic crust that was generated here, this dark gray oceanic crust, has moved laterally away from the mid-oceanic ridge. And along the mid-oceanic ridge, we are now generating crust that has a normal polarity, downward pointing in the northern hemisphere. And again, these segments of seafloor move laterally away, and they make space for a, another period, again with reverse polarity, and so on and so on. And you always will see along the mid-oceanic ridge, we observe the youngest oceanic crust. And the oceanic crust is getting older and older the further you are away from the mid-oceanic ridge. We see here an uh, illustration where specific segments are labeled in specific uh, letters. Uh, you can look up in your textbook uh, further information on this kind of labeling. And uh, you can revise the seafloor spreading and magnetic anomalies that come together with the generation of oceanic lithosphere. What we see here is a data record into the uh, geological past. And uh, this reaches back about 170 million years, which is in the early Mesozoic, in the Jurassic. And we see here a data record how often the polarity in the seafloor has changed over time. And you see 
each little strip that changes from dark gray to light gray is a reversal of the Earth magnetic field. You can see that happens very often, but there are times, like for instance here in the Cretaceous, where a long time of magnetic normal polarity uh, prevailed over uh, something like uh, 30, 40 million years. Usually the intervals of polarity reversals are much smaller. The magnetic reversals that we see documented in the paleomagnetic records of oceanic lithosphere uh, become more important and more relevant if they are seen in context with absolute age dating of the oceanic lithosphere because here we can determine the age of oceans and we can see how long they actually need to develop. How long does it take to develop a large oceanic basin like the Atlantic or the Pacific? This is something that was entirely unknown uh, in the middle of the last century and great breakthroughs were made in the 1960s and 70s when absolute age dating became a more and more accessible source of information. Here we see a map of the oceanic floor and here we see the ages of oceanic seafloor. We can see obviously the youngest seafloor uh, generated in the last five million years. It's highlighted here in red. These are narrow zones along the mid-oceanic ridges, along of which the seafloor is generated. Laterally away from the seafloor, we see the colors are changing, and here we see a color segment in orange. Uh, this covers about 15 million years of the Miocene. In the Miocene, we had quite a productive period of uh, ocean floor production in the Pacific. Uh, also some ocean floor was generated in the Indian Ocean, a bit less in the Atlantic. In the Oligocene we see a similar pattern, wider strips in the Pacific, narrower strips in the Atlantic and in the Indian Ocean, and uh, so it goes back into Jurassic time, Jurassic ages of 145 to 160 million years. We only see here in the Western Pacific and also here in the Northwestern Atlantic. These are the oldest pieces of seafloor that we know today on Earth. So here on slide 37 we see a cross-section that shows a lot of technical terms that you will come across and that you have to be able to handle as a geologist. And uh, we see here uh, this cross-section through the oceanic lithosphere, we see along a mid-oceanic ridge, new oceanic lithosphere is generated, seafloor spreading creates the space, and this is a way an ocean can grow. Since we see here that uh, new oceanic lithosphere is created, and since the Earth can't increase in size, we also have to have a mechanism how to destroy such oceanic lithosphere that we generate here. This happens in subduction zones. We see here so the subduction of oceanic lithosphere is associated with the generation of deep oceanic trenches and with volcanic arcs that happen to form on top of such subducting plates. We see here continents are often nearby such subduction zones and in continents we might find continental rift zones where continents are breaking apart. We might find collisional mountain belts where continental crust is getting thickened and also the lithospheric mantle underneath is getting thickened. The continental crust and the lithospheric mantle make up the continental lithosphere, which is underlain by the asthenosphere. Mantle plumes might form hotspot volcanoes somewhere in oceanic uh, environments, but also, as you might learn in the future in igneous petrology, in continental environments. There are things that are called transform plate boundaries, divergent plate boundaries, and uh, triple junctions, and transform plate boundaries. You see a plethora of technical terms. So now, very often, students might approach this situation in such a format. They just uh, use such diagrams to wrote learn where which term would apply and where to write uh, the correct name onto such a picture. And I must admit I have used uh, this example here as a test uh, question some years back and uh, in hindsight I think this was not a very good test question because it would probably uh, make students 
just uh, learning how to fill in the blanks with the right words. This is not really good quality learning. Good quality learning would mean that you actually do not only know that this is here a mid-oceanic ridge, and that is what it is called, and that there is a process called seafloor spreading happening along mid-oceanic ridges. Good learning would mean that you understand why it happens and how it happens, and that you can explain how seafloor spreading actually works. We are going to learn this in this course, at least in the very basics, and uh, good learning would enable you to explain how seafloor spreading happens, how oceans can grow, or how they get destroyed if we talk about a subduction zone and subduction-related volcanism. Why do uh, magmas form in such a situation and nowhere else in the history of the evolution of such oceanic plates? So these are the things I would like to give you on the way. It is very important that you know technical terms, but it is even more important that you understand what these terms mean and what they stand for, the processes they describe, the processes they label. Uh, the processes are in some way more important uh, to understand for you, but it is also important for you to know the technical terminology in order to communicate what you have learned and what you have understood about geology. Let's talk about lithospheric plates. Let's talk about the structural elements and the physical principles that drive plate tectonics. And this is a relatively long section that we are going to talk about. This will uh, also cover a good share of the next lecture. And uh, we are starting here with uh, four points, the nature of lithospheric plates, the types of plate boundaries, tectonic activities along plate boundaries, and the processes that lead to continental breakup, continental drift, and continent collision. Here we see cross-sections and block diagrams that illustrate how the Earth looks like, and you have seen these diagrams already in Earth Science 101. I just want to refresh your mind. We see here in this block diagram uh, lithospheric plates, and we see the boundary between the asthenospheric mantle and the lithospheric mantle. This boundary is here strongly exaggerated in its topography, in its uh, change in depth, but in principle, what we see here is correct. Thickened continental crust under collisional continent collisional belts like the Himalayas, for instance, where two continents have collided in the geological past, these areas show the thickest lithosphere that we see on Earth. Here we see a thick lithospheric mantle underlying a thickened crust, and uh, this is uh, several times as thick as oceanic lithosphere. The lithosphere is the stiffer outer part of the Earth. This is the entity that actually migrates over the Earth's surface. There's not only the crust, continental crust, or oceanic crust, it is also the underlying upper part of the Earth's mantle, the stiffer upper part that is detached from the softer asthenospheric mantle that is underlying the lithospheric mantle. Here's a more realistic uh, thickness variation diagram of the different layers of the Earth with the crust, with the upper mantle. There is a transition zone, a lower mantle, an outer core, and an inner core. And all that together makes a radius of the Earth of 6,371 kilometers. The two subdivision schemes that we see here are different. This here is a compositional subdivision of uh, material changes that uh, would separate the crust, oceanic or continental crust, where we have highly silicic material, specifically in the continental crust, from what we call ultramafic mantle material that is underlying it. In the mantle, in the upper mantle, we have much less silica than we would have in the crust. I don't want to bore you now with uh, specific numbers, but you will come back in the petrology classes that you will attend uh, to the um, absolute composition of these areas. For the point of view of plate tectonics, it is more important that we look at the mechanical subdivision. Rheology 
is the technical term that describes the mechanical behavior of rocks. The mechanical or rheological subdivision looks into the physical behavior of a rocks, whether they are relatively stiff and can move as a plate-like entity, like uh, the lithostratic plates, or whether we are dealing with a relatively soft material, like in the asthenospheric mantle, that can uh, flow much more easily than the stiffer material of the lithosphere. So these two subdivisions uh, we need to recognize. Compositional variations are very useful to uh, investigate for petrological or chemical purposes. So in the petrology classes uh, that you will attend, you will deal much more often with this kind of subdivision compared to the mechanical subdivision that is important for tectonics and structural geology. So let's have here a more detailed look into the subdivision of the uppermost layers of the Earth, which are from the mechanical point of view for us the most important ones. The lithosphere here is the outer part, and as I have said before, this is mechanically strong, relatively stiff material. This would be the crust that we see here is relatively thin in the oceanic environment. It is a bit thicker in the continents. And uh, we see here the underlying lithospheric mantle, which again is a little bit thicker under the continents compared to the oceanic plates. Shown in orange here, we have the asthenosphere that is a plastic solid. It is mechanically soft. Slow convective flow is possible. But this is not a liquid. And I will say that uh, probably every time in each lecture, or maybe several times in each lecture, the asthenosphere is essentially a solid material. It is uh, mechanically soft, perhaps like tar on a hot day. Uh, probably even less soft, but compared to the very stiff lithosphere, this can very, very slowly convect and flow. So this material is fairly mobile compared to the lithospheric mantle material, which uh, cannot flow in some kind of currents. So this is the big difference between this material and that material. It is essentially mechanical. It is, from the compositional or chemical point of view, uh, very similar. Lithospheric mantle material and asthenospheric mantle material are pretty much the same. What is the difference is the temperature. This part here is a bit cooler than this part, and from a certain threshold temperature, this material becomes soft. You can think about steel, for instance. Steel, you know, is a very hard material, but if you heat it up to five or 600 degrees, you will see that steel can be bent without breaking. And nevertheless, even 500 degrees hot steel is not a liquid. So here what we see is a difference, not in material. We see a difference in mechanical behavior that is controlled by a difference in temperature. We see here, again, the internal structure of the Earth now shown in a different diagram that comes from a different textbook, uh, where we see here on the right-hand side the compositional layering as opposed to the mechanical layering here on the other side. Here we see the lithospheric plates overlying the asthenosphere. Here we see the crust and the upper mantle. And the upper mantle is separated from the lower mantle by a transition zone. Here are certain uh, mineralogical changes happening that you will hear about in other courses. Uh, here we are only looking at mechanical behavior between lithosphere and asthenosphere. The term mesosphere is uh, probably a little bit outdated. It's uh, correlated usually with the lower mantle uh, in the compositional nomenclature. Uh, the term mesosphere is, uh, I think, largely obsolete, and this boundary is mechanically not very important. Underlain is the asthenosphere, or the mantle, by the uh, liquid outer core, and the outer core is the only large reservoir of melt on planet Earth. This is a liquid, iron-rich, iron-nickel-rich alloy uh, that is uh, a 
fluid in the mechanical sense and is behaving as it is uh, like a, a molten metal. Uh, it is underlain by the solid inner core that again is identical in material to the outer core, but the, the high pressure in the core converts what is liquid here into a hot solid material. What is important for the mechanical behavior is the uh, physical state of the, uh, of the various layers in, uh, in the Earth. And uh, this diagram here is uh, fairly complex. It's not very easy to understand, and we try to take it uh, step by step. What we see here is a cross-section with uh, depth here on the left-hand side and with a kind of a mixed nomenclature of the uh, uh, layering on the right-hand side. You see here the term lower mantle, in fact, as we see here, comes from the mechanical nomenclature. The lithosphere here comes from the rheological a nomenclature, so it's not quite consistent. But for our purposes, we uh, probably will see what is going on here. Here's the core mantle boundary with the uh, liquid outer core and the inner core as a solid iron nickel alloy. We see two curves here, a yellow one and a red one. The yellow one is what we call the geotherm. The geotherm describes the normally expected temperature of the Earth at a specific depth. Temperature is given here on the uh, x-axis, and we see here the temperature ranges in the Earth between uh, something close to 0 degrees to uh, something close to 5,000 degrees in the inner core. We see here that uh, close to the surface, the Earth has a fairly low temperature, and this temperature increases fairly quickly down to the bottom of the lithosphere to something like uh, close to 1,000 degrees, 600 to 1,000 degrees, somewhere here. That would be somewhere at the bottom of the lithosphere. When we go into the mantle, you see that the geotherm is steepening, and that means with increasing depth, the temperature is increasing more slowly than we have seen here in the uppermost part. This is a fairly steady increase in temperature, and at the bottom of the uh, solid silicic mantle, we find another quite quick increase to temperatures of about 3,700 degrees. After that, we see that the temperature again steadily but slowly increases until we reach the maximum temperature of uh, 4,700 degrees approximately in the inner core. So this describes just the situation as it is. This is the temperature we can see here in 2,000 kilometers depth. The Earth has a temperature of something over 2,000 degrees. And in 4,000 kilometers depth, somewhere in the uh, outer core, we have a temperature close to 4,000 degrees. So now we have here a different curve. The red curve describes the melting condition for the material at a given depth. So if we are looking at 2,000 kilometers depth, we are in the lower mantle. And lower mantle material at this depth would require here a certain temperature to form melt, and this temperature would be something over 3,000 degrees. When we are somewhere in the uh, outer core, we see that material uh, as we have it in the outer core, so an iron nickel alloy at 4,000 kilometers would require something like just under 4,000 degrees. That, uh, that would be sufficient to cause melting. And when we compare these two curves, the real temperature that we have available and the temperature that is required to cause melting, we see that in the mantle there is a large difference between the temperature that we have, which is significantly lower than the temperature that we need to generate melt. This means that here, wherever the yellow curve is on the left-hand side of the right-hand curve, material is solid. Where it is the other way around, like in the outer core, there we have conditions where the material is actually hotter than is required to generate melt. 
And uh, this is uh, important because this explains why the outer core is liquid. It also ex explains why the inner core is solid because here these two curves again cross-cut each other. The inner core at this depth would require a temperature of uh, above 5,000 degrees here in the center of the Earth, but the temperature is slightly lower. The temperature at the center of the Earth is something like 4,700 or 4,800 degrees. This is not enough to cause melting in the inner core. The temperature in the outer core is high enough to cause melting because the pressure is lower and the relationship between pressure and temperature and material is critical for whether a rock can melt or it can't. This here is another interesting area. Here we see uh, where we have this dashed line here, this LVZ, which is called the low velocity zone. Here we see that the geotherm and the melting conditions actually overlap. This is an area where melting just can happen at small proportions. And this is mechanically important for plate tectonics and for the movement of lithospheric plates, as we will see. We have been talking about the mechanically stiff lithosphere consisting of crust and lithospheric mantle, and the underlying asthenospheric mantle, which is a plastic solid. And we have just seen here, in its entity, this is a solid material apart from this small area here, the low velocity zone. And here we see, again, that is where the low velocity zone is positioned. The low velocity zone is the boundary between the lithospheric mantle and the asthenospheric mantle. And here, at a temperature of about 1,280 degrees, that is the definition that separates lithospheric mantle, which is colder than 1,280 degrees, from asthenospheric mantle, that is hotter than 1,280 degrees. In this small interface here, small amounts of melts are present. And we are talking here about 2 or 3 volume percent of the rock that exists there. So this is not entirely liquid. It is just a little bit partially molten. And this partial melting is enough to lubricate this interface. This makes this interface much weaker than the lithospheric mantle or the underlying asthenospheric mantle, which again is entirely solid. Because of this mechanical weakness, this lubrication by minor amount of melts, this is the slip horizon for lithospheric plates. The low velocity zone is therefore mechanically very, very important for plate movements that shape the surface of the Earth. The reason why we call this the low velocity zone comes from geophysical investigations. Uh, you will learn more about uh, seismic investigations in your second or third uh, year of geology. The low velocity zone is called low velocity zone because seismic waves are slowing down in this horizon because the present partial melt uh, slows down the propagation velocity of uh, seismic waves. And this can be measured at the surface. So the low velocity refers not to mechanical movement. It refers to the propagation velocity of seismic waves that can be generated either artificially or by large earthquakes somewhere in the stiff and brittle part of the lithosphere somewhere up here. Let's have a look at a few characteristics of the lithospheric plates that we have not yet covered. Uh, let's look at the continental lithosphere. The continental lithosphere in total can be around uh, 150 kilometers thick, and uh, the crust normally has a thickness of about 30 to 40 kilometers. This is variable in uh, areas here where we see that the continental crust grades into oceanic crust. It becomes considerably thinner. In continent collision zones like the Himalayas or the Alps, it can be up to uh, 70 or 100 kilometers thick. What is typical for the continental lithosphere is that it has a relatively low density because the minerals that it is composed of have a low density. And in the continental crust, we find a lot of feldspar, we find a lot of quartz, 
and these minerals have a lower density than the minerals that are uh, making up the lithospheric mantle, for instance. When we look here at the oceanic lithosphere, we see it is considerably thinner. 100 kilometers is a typical thickness, and the crust is uniformly 7 to 10 kilometers thick. Uh, the crust has a relatively high density and a mafic composition. Here we find a, a lot of um, uh, pyroxenes, uh, amphiboles perhaps, uh, also chloride and uh, feldspars. The underlying mantle. Uh, the lithospheric mantle or the asthenospheric mantle now have high density minerals, ultramafic composition. Now here we find minerals like olivine and clinopyroxene, perhaps also some orthopyroxene. So let's have a quick view on uh, buoyancy and density contrasts uh, because this will teach us why the continental crust uh, and the surface of the continents are actually uh, floating higher and are usually uh, above sea level apart from some uh, shelf regions which are typically uh, flooded by oceanic water and uh, why the oceans are uh, almost exclusively uh, below the seawater level. Let's have a look at this little uh, analog experiment where we see here uh, two logs of oak floating in water. These logs of oak they are differently thick, a thin one over here, a thicker one over here and on top of these uh, logs of oak, we have here a fairly thick layer of cork and here a thinner layer of pine. And uh, the analog is that the oak is uh, here resembling the fairly thick lithospheric mantle underneath the continental crust. And here the, the thinner oak layer would resemble the thinner lithospheric mantle underneath the oceanic crust. The cork of course would be the uh, thick, felsic and low density continental crust. Uh, you know cork has a lower density than pine. And here we have a thin pine layer that resembles the thin higher density oceanic crust. So what you would observe in such an experiment is that the uh, thicker lithosphere uh, of the continent would, although it is thicker and heavier, would uh, float higher out of the water then the thinner log of oak and pine resembling the thinner oceanic lithosphere. And uh, this difference here uh, makes the difference between uh, land, dry land, and uh, flooded oceanic lithosphere. So in short, the thick continental lithosphere with an overall low density and a higher total mass nevertheless has a higher buoyancy. It floats higher and therefore has a higher topography that we see in the continents, whereas the oceans are usually uh, topographically lower and uh, are flooded with sea waters, apart from very few places on Earth. You can learn a little bit more about the principle of buoyancy in which the uh, mass, the density, and the volume uh, are important players. And uh, you might know from your physics lectures at high school level uh, this example of uh, icebergs, which are 80% submerged in seawater and uh, only 20% about of the uh, iceberg uh, is visible above sea level. This is a matter of the displacement of uh, water by the lower density ice, which therefore sticks out of the water a little bit. But I leave that for yourself study to uh, revise in the textbook. You see here this comes from uh, chapter 4 in Portrait of a Planet here, the 2008 edition. Uh, but you also find that same example in the newer 2012 edition of Marshak's textbook. Uh, so much for today. Thank you very much.